Christ. If you would, turn in your copy of God's Word to Matthew chapter 18. We're going to be looking at verses 21 through 35 this morning. <clears throat> Keep your finger there as I share a few introductory comments before we read the passage together. Throughout this beautiful chapter of Holy Scripture, Jesus has been teaching us about the kinds of characteristics which are to define the community of his redeemed people on earth. The church who has been purchased by Jesus' blood and who gladly lives under Jesus' lordship is not to pattern themselves after the worldviews, values, beliefs, or lifestyles of the fallen and unbelieving world. We are a people chosen by God and set apart by God to shine like lights in the midst of a dark and depraved generation. We are a city on a hill meant to shine the light of the glory of God for others to see and be drawn to the same saving faith that God has granted to us. And therefore, in contrast to the world's definitions of greatness, Jesus has been showing us throughout this chapter that a truly great person in the kingdom of God is very much unlike the definition of a great person in the world. In the kingdom of God, Jesus has shown us several characteristics that are to define his people. And they are these. He's shown us that a truly great person is humble in his relationship to God. He lives in humble submission before the Almighty. He is careful in his relationships to fellow believers. He makes himself a glad servant of others. He is ruthless in his relationship to sin. He makes radical war against all that God calls sin and joyfully pursues a life of holiness. We've seen that he is compassionate in his relationship toward the wayward. He lovingly pursues fellow believers who are straying from God. We saw last time we were together that he is confrontational in his relationship to the wayward. He boldly confronts fellow believers who have wandered into sin. And this morning, Jesus will show us the sixth and final piece in this chapter of teaching here in Matthew 18, and that is this, that a truly great person in the eyes of God is merciful, merciful in his relationship to the offenses of others. In other words, he forgives the offenses of others even as God has forgiven him. And so I ask you to stand with me now as I read God's word with, to you from Matthew chapter 18 beginning in verse 21. This is the word of the living God. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servants, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger... His master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. 
so also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. And thus ends the reading of God's word. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will endure forever. Please be seated. Before we dive into the particulars of our text today, I want to show you something about the overall structure of Matthew 18. I want you to think with me. This is part six of of six sermons we've had on Matthew 18, and I want to show you something about the overall structure. Last time we were together in Matthew, we talked about the important but difficult subject of church discipline. We talked about how Jesus Christ calls those who are members of his church to live in relationships of accountability with one another and in submission to local elders whom the Holy Spirit has called to shepherd the flock of God. For many people, this teaching of Holy Scripture is one which is either loudly rejected or quietly neglected. Very few professing Christians submit to the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ on this issue. I think we should ask the question, why? Why is, it that, why is it the case that so few Christians who profess to believe and trust and submit to the Lord Jesus Christ deny him and rebel against him and his lordship on this particular point? There are many important answers to that question. But the reason that I would like to draw your attention to this morning is this. It is because sinful men think that they have a wiser and more desirable definition of love than God himself. They believe that the call of Holy Scripture to exercise accountability and church discipline among those who profess faith in Christ is somehow unloving, judgmental, mean-spirited, and all the like. But I want to call your attention to two points this morning to show you that although this perspective about church discipline is extremely popular, It is nevertheless absolutely false. Look again at the structure of Jesus' presentation of the Christian's call to both submit to and participate in the work of church discipline. Before Jesus issues the call to confrontation, what does he give in in the passage? He gives us a call to compassion, the parable of the lost sheep. Before confrontation, he gives the parable of the lost sheep, which calls us to a loving compassion toward other Christians. And directly following the passage on church discipline or the call to confrontation, what does he give us today? A passage which calls us to be radically merciful in the forgiveness of the sins of others. In other words, what do we have in our text, beloved? Church discipline is literally enveloped and surrounded by God's strong instruction that it first must be approached from a heart of Christ-like love and compassion. And secondly, that it must always accord to the measure of mercy which we hope in as Christians. In other words, the world's idea that church discipline is unloving, or perhaps your idea That church discipline is unloving, something not to be desired by the Christian, a portion of Jesus' teaching which we can set aside. Dear one, I urge you this morning to believe and see you are mistaken. The Word of God is perfect and good and true and right. And far from church discipline being something contrary to love, it is itself an expression of true Christian love. And the second thing which sort of builds on this that I want to show you that leads us into our text this morning is the burden Peter felt. Peter was a firsthand listener to Jesus' teaching on church discipline. He was standing right there. He heard not only Jesus' words as we have, he heard Jesus' tone of voice. He saw Jesus' face. He could read his body language as he taught this. And therefore, I would ask you to look at the text with me and ask this question. Peter, as a first-hand listener to Jesus Christ's teaching on church discipline, what was the burden that Peter took away from that teaching? Turn your eyes with me now to verse 21 of our text. What does it say? Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me 
and I, what? Condemn him? No, forgive him. The burden that Peter felt as a firsthand listener to Jesus Christ's teaching on church discipline was that it called Peter not to a spirit of condemnation, but to a spirit of forgiveness. It called Peter to stretch himself, to be more willing to look upon the guilty with mercy than he was presently accustomed to doing. And dear ones, I put that before you to shove back against the world's narrative that Christianity is harsh on this point. People, sinful people may be harsh on this point, but our Lord and Savior is not. And those who are following him are not to be. The burden Peter felt was toward a deeper and more radical heart of forgiveness for the guilty. And so let's look at our text this morning and see what this parable has to teach us. But first, a little more on Peter's question. Peter's question really boils down to this. It is a question asking how forgiving are Christians called to be? How forgiving are we called to be, Jesus? And notice Peter offers a suggestion, right? (coughs) He says, up to seven times I should forgive my brother. Now, what you may not know is that it was current Jewish teaching or the consensus among Jewish rabbis at this time that a person should be forgiven up to three times. And after that, you were entitled to no longer extend forgiveness. Now, that was what the common popular idea was at this time. Well, no wonder then, Peter's probably thinking, I'm being rather generous here, right? I've, I've offered seven. That's double the popular standard plus one. Peter's probably thinking, I'm, I'm doing it, Jesus. I'm being a, a radically forgiving person. And what Jesus will show us in this text is that while Peter was perhaps trending in the right direction, he had a long way to go because the forgiveness of God is far greater still. And therefore, the forgiveness we show must be far greater still also. And so what does Peter say, excuse me, Jesus say to Peter in response? Actually, let me say a little more about Peter first. What was Peter doing? Well, when he offers this suggestion of seven, he was failing to realize that this standard that he recommended was a standard that he himself could never meet. Think about this with me. Okay, he's going to get out his score sheet, right? And he's going to start keeping tallies. All right, so you've sinned against me once. All right, you've sinned against me twice. Let me just ask you to think for just a moment. What would happen if the Almighty God took Peter's standard and turned it to Peter and began to apply it to him? Okay, Peter, that's one. Okay, Peter, that's two. Wouldn't be long. Might not even be lunchtime before we already eclipsed the standard, right? And so what Peter didn't realize is that he was holding up a standard which he himself could never hope to meet. And I want to ask you this morning to reflect humbly. Is that your standard? The standards of judgment that you hold against other people, if those standards were turned and held against you, would you be able to meet them? Jesus' response to Peter is a way of saying, Peter, it is not a matter of calculation or of keeping track of a score. It's a matter of reciprocation, Peter. Not calculation, but of reciprocation. Now, reciprocity, we usually mean by that, we'll do unto others as they do unto us. But I'm not talking about reciprocation of what man does. Christians don't live in reciprocation of what their fellow man does. Christians live in reciprocation of what God has done for them. And that's what Peter needed to see. You see, Peter was still viewing others according to a strict assessment of the books, according to their deserts or what they deserve. But dear ones, Christians do not treat people the way they deserve to be treated. Christians do not treat people the way they deserve to be treated. That is not our standard. The way Christians relate to other people is determined by the way God has first related to us in Christ. Peter needed to see that. And I believe we need to see the same. 
This means that far from determining our relationships by checking the numbers on our scorecard, we, we are to have a disposition of radical self-sacrifice, of forgiveness and mercy toward those who do us wrong. And isn't that what Jesus says? Peter, you're asking if it's up to seven times. It's not seven times. Seventy-seven times. And 77 isn't even the number either. He's not saying you need a bigger scorecard. He's saying, Peter, you need a new paradigm for thinking about how Christians are to live in relationships in this world. The answer to Peter's question of how forgiving a Christian is called to be can only be answered by that Christian first considering how forgiving God has been to them. The answer to the question, how forgiving are Christians called to be, can only be answered by you, dear Christian, considering how forgiving has God first been to me. And the burden of this text will say, you go then and do likewise. That's the whole message of this text, and Jesus now gives us a parable to teach us that very thing. How forgiving has God been to us? That's the big question Jesus will answer in the first part of this parable, which is often called the parable of the unforgiving servant. Let me read you verses 23 through 26. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. The first thing Jesus does in his response to Peter and his instruction to us is he gives us a picture of ourselves before God. He gives us a picture of ourselves before God. We cannot possibly understand the way we are called to relate to the sins of others until we understand the way God has related to our sins in Christ. And so with the skill of a masterful teacher, that's the very thing Jesus shows us. The first thing we see is a king who decided to have a day of reckoning. And what is a day of reckoning? What did he call for? Bring the books. Don't lose this image. What was Peter doing? He's saying, up to seven times, should I keep a record? Some marks here. And he's saying, well, let's imagine a king who brings out the books that have kept the records, a day of reckoning or a day of judgment by careful calculation. And on that day, a servant is brought before him. And I want you to know the servant in this parable represents you. You are this servant Jesus is calling out here. A servant is brought before him. And what, was, what are we told about that servant? Well, he was found to owe the king an unfathomable debt, 10,000 talents. Now, that may not mean a whole lot to you because we don't use talents today, but I want to give you something of the gravity of what Jesus is saying the debt of this servant is. And by way of corollary, your debt before God as well. <clears throat> One talent was equivalent to 6,000 days wages. 10,000 talents would take approximately 200,000 years to earn for the average worker. And if you take into account the fact that none of us work 24-7, that equals out to approximately 2,600 lifetimes. Jesus is making a pretty clear point, isn't he? This man is a man who is guilty of a debt which he cannot <coughs> ever hope to pay back. Nothing that he has or nothing that he could ever earn would be sufficient to eclipse the debt he owed. And beloved, in this picture, Jesus is describing your position before God without his cross. Jesus is describing your and my position before God without his cross. We are this man who owes a debt to God that we could never hope to pay. And the reality is, is that if the king is to relate to this servant purely by the books, by the accounts, by Peter's suggestion, 
What would be the outcome for this man? He is without any hope. But that's not what the king does, is it? That is not what the king chooses to do for this guilty servant. Although it would be perfectly just for the king to punish him, instead he shows him mercy. Verse 27, out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. I want you to notice that the king did not spare the servant upon condition of repayment. He didn't say, okay, we'll let this one slide, but you're going to have to work it off. And so many Christians live like that. So many Christians are still living in this idea that they have to work off the mercy God has given them. They don't understand that that is not the nature of the gospel. This servant owed a debt he could never have hoped to pay. And God didn't say, well, I'll give you a little more time. He didn't say, I'll take 50% of it away. He said, all that you owe, I will bear for you. So that you are walking out of this courtroom, this day of judgment, this reckoning day, as one who owes nothing, as one who is free of condemnation and guilt. That's what the king did for this man. And beloved, this is a picture of the gospel. The servant deserved a judgment from which he would never be free. But the king mercifully forgave him and wiped the record completely clean. This is what God offers to the world in Jesus Christ. And if you are confused in a day where the word Christian, the title Christian, is thrown around and stretched to mean all kinds of things that it doesn't mean, let me give you a, a really simple definition of what a Christian believes. A Christian is one who profess, professes to believe that this very thing is what God has done for them through the life, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. A Christian is the one who believes that their 10,000 talents of guilt before God have been taken away because of what Jesus Christ has done in their place. And the question comes to us then in this passage, right? Jesus has set up this parable. He said, let's look at how God has treated you. But now it's going to lead us to wonder, how will this servant respond to such wonderful treatment? Perhaps even more to the point is not the question of how will the servant respond, but to Jesus' point, I think we should ask the question, how should the servant respond? That's the burden of the parable. And let's look and see what happens now in verses 28 through 30. But when the same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servants, so his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. Beloved, shockingly, the servant who had been forgiven so much was nevertheless unwilling to forgive a far lesser offense in another. And I want you to notice three elements in the parable, three contrastive elements in the parable. This second servant, this fellow servant, has a far lesser debt, a far lesser debt. Secondly, he had the exact same plea. It is almost word for word the same plea. And thirdly, he had a very different result. Far lesser debt, the exact same plea, but a very different result. Result. The forgiven was unwilling to forgive. The one who had received mercy was unwilling to show mercy to others. And what we have to recognize in this parable is that the man was not wrong. Maybe you're thinking, well, wait a minute, hang on, this guy's choking him, he's hollering at him. You need to, we need to be honest, he's not wrong. The man whom he was uh, accosting was guilty. The man owed him a hundred denarii. He was not wrong in the fact that he was rendering a judgment about this man's guilt. 
However, he was being exacting and cruel toward this man. And he was holding him to a standard that he himself could never have met. The fellow servants hear about this and they take word to the king, don't they? And in verses 31 through 32, let me read 32. This, then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. The king asks him essentially, Why have you done such a wicked thing? Why was your heart unwilling to forgive? I, I want you to think about that question for yourself this morning. Why is it that our hearts are so unwilling to forgive others? Why is it? Really press yourself here and think about what is the standard you are employing to justify your unwillingness to forgive that person. Take that standard then and turn it around. And consider if that standard were held to you, what would be the outcome for your soul. Jesus is pressing us hard here toward a radical heart of mercy. And the answer to the question of why was, our, was his heart unwilling to forgive others is because this wicked servant had never truly considered the radical guilt of his own case. I wonder if you are here this morning and you are afflicted with the rampant sickness of our day, that rampant sickness of a very arrogant and narcissistic self-love. Maybe you're afflicted with that view of yourself that you are just so wonderful. You're so good. You're so nice. Oh, yes, you have some rough edges. You make a few mistakes. But really, you're pretty good. Maybe you're here and you think, you know, I just don't sin that much. Dear one, if that is your heart, I plead with you to hold that heart up against the true standard of the Word of God and see that like this servant, your debt to God is very great and not something you could ever hope to pay for for yourself. Because the very reason he was unable to forgive others is because he did not realize the true situation of his own guilty heart. I want you to notice the contrast that Jesus put into our text. 100 denarii is what this fellow servant owed him, right? 100 denarii. That's 100 days wages, by the way. That's not an insignificant amount of money, right? If I don't have payment for 100 days, that'd put my family in a kind of a bind, right? A difficult situation. And we need to see that because Jesus is not pretending that forgiveness is easy in this text. Jesus is not pretending like this debt doesn't have a cost or doesn't have an effect on this servant. It absolutely hurts. And Jesus is not pretending otherwise. The sins people have done to you or will do to you, they hurt. And dare I say, sometimes they hurt like hell. And we want to scream and fight. And we are angry. And the Bible is not here saying that evil isn't evil. The Bible is saying you must measure the offenses of others by the guilt of your own heart if you would be one who operates in the character of Christ. That's what the Bible is saying. The reason that this servant remained cold, exacting, and harsh in his judgments toward other guilty persons was because he did not yet truly understand the magnitude of his own guilt. The 100 denarii debts of others will always seem great and be difficult for us to forgive until we learn to evaluate them by first measuring them against the 10,000 talents of debt and guilt that we have before God. Compared to a penny, $5 is great. Compared to a million dollars, $5 is nothing. Hold 
the sins of others, the debts of others, the failings of others, up against the wickedness of your heart, which God has forgiven of you. That's what this text is saying. That if this servant understood what the king had done for him and who he really was, it would have changed everything about how he related to his fellow man. It does not change the fact that his fellow man was guilty, but it changes the way he relates to that man's guilt. And that is the burden of this passage. Once we realize, beloved, that the mercy we may be called to show others will never be greater than the mercy which God has first shown to us in Christ, we will be set free to look upon fellow sinners with true Christian compassion. I want to read that to you again because if you understand what I just said, you get this passage and it will change your life. Once we realize that the mercy which we may be called to show others will never be greater than the mercy which God has first shown to us in Christ, we will be set free to look upon fellow sinners with true Christian compassion. And verse 33 is where Jesus brings it home, doesn't he? What does he say? And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant, don't miss this, as I had mercy on you. That is the whole point Jesus is making. The forgiven, the freely forgiven, the undeservingly forgiven are to freely and undeservingly forgive. Those who have received a mercy for which they had no claim are to extend a mercy to others who have no merit for receiving it. That's what Jesus is telling us in this text. So what is Peter's question? His question was, how forgiving are Christians called to be? How forgiving are Christians called to be, Jesus? His answer is, as forgiving as God has been to you. That's the answer. And we would think that Jesus would wrap it up there, but he's, he's not willing to. You have to love our Lord Jesus because he knows what we need. He knows that in our sinful hearts we'll, we'll wrangle this And therefore, lovingly, like a good father, he gives us not only the good word, but also a word of warning, don't go this way. And what does he say in verses 34 and 35? He tells us one more line in the parable, and then he gives one more comment of his own. What did the king do after he said these words to this wicked servant? He said, and in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. And that word jailers there, you should know, could very likely and perhaps should be translated as torturers. Jailers is a very soft translation of that word, and most commentators believe that the word really should be translated torturers. Jesus is not pulling any punches. He takes this seriously, beloved. He takes the Christian's call to love as they have been loved, to forgive as they have been forgiven very, very seriously. And therefore, we too must beg God to help us take it seriously. And where unforgiveness lives in our hearts, don't hide it. Don't pretend it's not there. Take it to the throne of grace. Confess it as the sin that it is and beg God for help. To enlarge in your own eyes your own guilt, that you would see who you really are and appreciate the gospel of grace all the more so that you then would be one who exudes and lives out that same grace in your dealings with all kinds of people in this world. And Jesus gives us one more line, doesn't he? His own comments on this parable. He says, so also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you, that is, deliver you to the jailers, If you do not forgive your brother from the heart. What we see happening in this text is this. The judgment which this servant used against others is the judgment which the king used against him. The judgment that this servant used against others is the judgment the king used against him. It's as if the king said to the wicked servant, So, 
I hear you want to do things strictly by the books. Well, that's just fine. Let's pull out the books then, shall we? Let's apply that same exacting and stringent judgment which you have used toward others back upon yourself and then see how you fare under that measurement. Isn't that what the king does here? And isn't that Jesus' warning to sober us and ultimately to call us to be a people who are radically forgiving even as God has been toward us? You see, God's judgment will be without mercy toward those who show no, more, no mercy toward the sins of others. That's essentially a quote of James chapter 2, verse 13. God's judgment will be without mercy toward those who show no mercy toward the sins of others. This is not because acts of forgiveness and mercy are works which we must perform in order to earn salvation. It is because a heart that is unwilling to show mercy toward the sins of others is a heart that has not yet truly understood the reality of its own 10,000 talents of wretchedness and guilt before God, and is therefore a heart that has not yet truly come to the end of itself and placed its full hope in the undeserved mercy of God in Christ. That's what Jesus is saying. A sinful heart, dear ones, that has been rescued from hell by the undeserved mercy of God alone will be a heart that is willing to love its enemies and share with them the same undeserved mercy which it has first received. And this is the Word of God. And so my charge to you this morning is this. Dear Christian, love as you have been loved and forgive as you have been forgiven. And you can't miss both sides of that. You will not possibly know how to love unless you learn how you've been loved. And you will not possibly be able to forgive unless you understand how you have been forgiven. 